night. And uh, inevitably, if you can't get them to howl at you by imitating them yourself, sometime in the night, two, three o'clock in the morning, if they're anywhere in hearing distance, they'll howl. That helps me find them and put a collar on one. Of course, they live in packs, uh, alpha male, alpha female, the, the terminology really breeding male, breeding female, and the pack is normally composed mostly of sibling pups, uh, one, two, three-year-old animals. Um, of course, we've noticed in Yellowstone that sometimes that's not always the case, that there are multiple breeders. Uh, the Druid wolf pack in Yellowstone got as many as 37 animals, and uh, I think four or five uh, females breeding in that, within that one pack. So sometimes they violate the textbook. They have four to six pups. They breed mid-February, and this very week, as we stand here, this is the peak of wolf denning having pups. Uh, usually by around the 20th, 21st of, of April is the peak in Yellowstone and throughout the Northern Rockies. Uh, commonly they den in a hole, uh, a real extensive denning system, but uh, we found them next to logs, we found them under spruce trees, and even in nests out in the open in meadows. And so some of the females apparently don't get to the den or, or they're lazy and don't get their den dug in time. So it's not always a den hole. I spent my, most of my field career working in the field looking at dead livestock. And so uh, you become a specialist in you know, how did the animal die, what killed it, or what didn't kill it. And so I particularly was looking for wolf damage. But uh, in the case of sheep, it, it's difficult because dogs bite them in the neck lions, black bears, grizzly bears, and wolves, uh, sometimes a fox even. And so uh, a lot of predators go for a sheep's neck, but a lot of times wolves will also bite them in the flanks or on the hips or down the hind legs. Uh, bear damage is usually over the top, biting on top of the neck and shoulders, even on large livestock. Mountain lions go for the neck and over the back of the neck. Uh, again, sometimes you have to be looking for footprints and other evidence to go with uh, uh, the death of a sheep. The big, the important thing is notice all that massive hemorrhage. That indicates the animal had blood pressure, uh, that, that there was a traumatic injury there, and that's really crucial to look for to see if a predator killed it. Uh, if they just died from something and you skin the animal carcass out, you're just going to see the, the flesh without all this massive hemorrhage. I skin out all the animals entirely, especially beef cattle. Uh, I learned early on if I took a shortcut and didn't take all the hide off, then the rancher accused me of not skinning out that part of the carcass because I knew the tooth bites were under that piece of hide. And so I peel it all off. And uh, in the case of beef cattle, again, you can see it takes trauma and shock to bring down these big animals. And so when people say, well, you know, people can't tell for sure, they don't know. Uh, if there's any amount of that carcass left, I can guarantee you if, if a wolf killed it, that's what it's going to look like. They, it's not kid's play and it's not a little purple spot on the animal. It's massive, the, the muscles are, are crushed until the animal can't stand up. And uh, again, you can see lots and lots of hemorrhage. And of course, there's other issues, uh, you know, besides just killing our stock, you know, they're running the weight off of them. Uh, you know, we, our cattle came in 20 pounds lighter and all of this. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, in drought years, livestock come home lighter too. And so you have to take that all into consideration and, and some of these things are just difficult, if not impossible to measure. Uh, the other thing that's happened since wolves is that uh, Ranchers have gone heavy using guard dogs like that Pyrenees dog there. And these guard dogs are usually employed now up to four to six guard dogs per uh, nomadic sheep band in Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. And sometimes the wolves still are killing the sheep in spite of the guard dogs, but the guard dogs have really diminished the damage by black bears, mountain lions, and coyotes. And so it's been a big improvement for the sheep industry and the guard dogs are there to bark and warn shepherds who are supposed to be there to protect the sheep and the guard dog. 
Uh, you already know last night I gave away the secret. This was supposed to be memorized entirely before you leave tonight. So, bottom line, I just wanted you to see this is a table out of the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf Annual Report this year. <clears throat> and this column down here summarizes the three states. So, I mean, you can get the individual information from here. Uh, but just notice about 1,500 cattle have been killed. Uh, 3,100 sheep, uh, 83 others, those are llamas, horses, and an assortment of other oddball critters, and goats, <clears throat> and uh, 144 dogs. Most of the dogs that have been killed have been, a lot of them have been hounds hunting mountain lions and black bears. They're bawling, running through the woods, and the wolves hear them and are drawn to that sound. Uh, the wolves look at them as competitors and as, a, as invaders of their territory and they run up and kill them sometimes right at the base of the tree before the hunter gets there. Uh, people got to learn to live with that because it's, it's a fact that's going to happen and if you love your dog, you're going to have to take that into consideration. All along, uh, there's been wolf control even when they were fully uh, endangered in the early years in the, up in the mid-1980s when we had the first damage, even though they were fully protected under the Endangered Species Act, control was still allowed, and you can see that 1,500 wolves have died in the Northern Rockies since uh, wolves start showing up. The thing I want you to notice is, though, <clears throat> if you take all those sheep and cattle, that's over a 24-year period. So if you divide it out, maybe 60, 62 cattle a year average, and probably 120 sheep a year. All I try to remind people of is, in the three-state area, in a given year, there's five and a half million beef cows going out on range, and there's 850,000 sheep going out on range each year. And so you can do the arithmetic and see that what the livestock they kill isn't a great number, <clears throat> but the seriousness of it and the emotion involved is that as agency managers, we've always tried to stop that damage and, and consider that this is a livestock that's owned by people and it does affect uh, some people's livelihood. But uh, they kill stock on some people's ranches, but not everyone's ranches. And, but in, in any event, uh, uh, the livestock industry is not real thrilled about having uh, big dogs turned loose in their backyard. The, the complicating factor is, too, there's federal grazing allotments involved, and many of this livestock uh, that's killed is on federal land. And uh, so they, there's give and take. We can talk about that later if you want. <clears throat> there's what happens to a guard dog that tries to protect the sheep. So guard dogs aren't designed to be out there to fight with wolves because they will never win. There, there's not a dog out there tough enough to, to whip a wolf, and especially a pack. So here's the species generally that, that wolves prey on. And uh, again, when we reintroduced wolves, everyone knew that they eat meat. And everyone knows that these are some of their primary prey species. But it's, a, it's another hot tamale right now for our sportsmen. Uh, they're very unwilling to share the game animals they hunt and the trophy animals they hunt with wolves. And I've had many hunters tell me that you never needed to bring wolves here because if you want more elk killed, I'll shoot it for you. You don't need a wolf to eat it. Uh, where elk are abundant, that's what wolves prefer. And so in many of these areas where uh, predominantly elk exist, uh, some of the uh, prey base is probably 95% of the wolf's diet will be those elk. And then, uh, of course, they kill some deer, some moose. Uh, whatever else. Uh, in some areas where, where beaver are abundant, they go in there and catch beaver during the winter where they come up out of their uh, colonies and have to go up on land and, and cut trees and the wolves can ambush them. Uh, I just threw these things together real quick. Uh, in the primary uh, diet is, are the ungulates. Uh, wolves can eat 10, 15, 20 pounds of meat uh, at a sitting sometimes and sometimes they eat this extra meat go up and they, they regurgitate it up on a hill and hide it and then come back and eat some more. So <clears throat> they can put away a lot of meat. Um, the kill rates that I'm showing you here are basically some from uh, Doug Smith's studies in Yellowstone, 12 to 22 elk per wolf per year. 
Uh, the kill rates go up in the winter when, when game animals are easier to catch. Uh, in the summertime, when, when the fawns and calves get some legs under them and are able to run, and the adults are in prime shape, uh, the kill rates go way down. They do kill the sick in the week. Uh, they call the herds. Uh, a lot of people resent someone like me telling them they kill the sick in the week. They say they kill everything. Well, not necessarily. But certainly healthy elk, when the snow gets five feet deep, become vulnerable and they can kill a perfectly healthy elk if, if it's post holing in the snow and the wolves are running on top. But uh, they're opportunistic and they catch what they can get. And of course livestock fit within that old sick week vulnerable because they're locked in fences and their, their ability to protect themselves has been bred out of them. And uh, cattlemen especially put their stock out and nobody's hurting or watching them. And again, all of you, if you're wildlife students, you certainly know that there's a lot of causes of death in ungulate herds. Uh, it's not just the wolf. Uh, there's people who will tell you, though, that the wolf is the straw that broke the camel's back. It is the principal cause of all of our grief uh, with uh, predation on, on wild ungulates. <clears throat> this, this table here came right out of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation Bugle magazine. And it, it's sort of contradictory because the Elk Foundation is very adamant that uh, wolves got to be reduced severely or it's going to damage the elk herds. Uh, they're even using words like decimate, exterminate. And in Idaho, if you, a week ago, they just passed an emergency disaster bill in the legislature because the wolves are wiping out all the elk and destroying the livestock industry. And the legislature signed off on this. It passed through the House and the Senate, and it's sitting on the governor's desk. And they really believe this stuff. Uh, main point I want to make is there's uh, been some decline of elk in Idaho in, in six out of 29 units. The rest are at or above management objectives. In Montana, you have the second highest elk herd in the United States. The herd's grown in about 20% in the last 25 years. It's expanding. And in Wyoming, the biggest joke of all is the, the former Governor Frudenthal said right up until he was uh, gave up running for election this year that uh, if we didn't get rid of the wolves in Wyoming, there wouldn't be any elk left. Their management objective is 80,000 elk, and the state has 120,000. So the wolves could eat 40,000, and they'd be doing the fishing game a favor. So anyhow, another thing that doesn't quite jive with the propaganda in the newspaper. Here's another one. Since the day we did the reintroduction, we've had congressmen warning us over and over and over again that the wolves are going to kill a kid at a bus stop. And like I said last night, uh, why a bus stop? But anyway, they're still waiting and it hasn't happened yet, but uh, you never know. Uh, there's been two people that I'm aware of in the last hundred years in the North American continent have been killed by wild, free-ranging wolves. And we can even show you the pictures of the two people who have been allegedly killed. This person here, uh, their death was questioned. They had a coroner's inquest. Uh, one wolf expert friend of mine said it was a bear depredation on him. Uh, the other friend of mine testified it was a wolf. And the coroner's jury decided they blame wolves for it, so wolves are or the fall guy for that death. And so you got two deaths in a hundred years and one of them are questionable. Another thing that uh, is being put out constantly, uh, how many of you have heard that the Echinococcus tapeworm is going to kill all of you? And in Idaho, they're saying don't picnic, don't camp on the grass, don't swim or go in the creeks or the lakes, and don't breathe the air. Because <laughs> All of those wolves we brought from Canada were infected with the echinococcus tapeworm. Well,